Today, we explored an aircraft unlike anything you've seen before. Resembling a tiny egg with wings, the Quest Air Venture's shape is both thought-provoking and yet puzzling. Why was it designed this way? Why is it so short? Can people actually fit in it? And what's up with the landing gear? How do you even land this thing? Wait a minute, this tail looks familiar. Where else have I seen it? All these questions and more are easily revealed once you get to know the true story behind this fascinating design. The Venture Saga begins in the late 1970s. Jim Griswold was a talented designer at Piper Aircraft, having previously worked for Cessna and Learjet. At a time when most Piper designs were utilitarian and not exactly exciting, Griswold created the Piper Malibu. The Malibu was unlike anything seen before in general aviation. It was slender, with a long nose, long wings, and sat on a tall landing gear. On other general aviation designs, the passenger was almost an afterthought. In the Malibu, however, the passenger took center stage and enjoyed luxurious accommodations in a pressurized cabin, allowing for long distance flights with less fatigue. In spite of the downturn of the economy in the 1980s, the Malibu sold pretty well. The Malibu's target market were high net worth individuals and corporations, both with deep pockets who could afford the expenses associated with a six passenger aircraft that was both pressurized and turbocharged. And that's when the light bulb went off for Mr. Griswold. What if there was a two-seater version of the Malibu? It would be infinitely cheaper to buy and operate. This mini Malibu would open up a whole new market for business travelers who needed to travel far, complete their mission, and get back home in time for supper and put the kids to bed. Let's see how Jim accomplished his goals with his mini Malibu design. Along with his Piper colleague Ed McDonough, Jim rounded up a few investors and set up a new company named Quest Air, settling in Greensboro, North Carolina. Their new aircraft was to be named the Venture. In a bid to get as many Ventures in pilots' hands across America, Jim decided to sell the aircraft as a kit. This would lower acquisition costs, mitigate risk, and liability. But most important of all, the Venture wouldn't have to jump through all the hoops required to get the aircraft certified especially in an era when litigation costs were making certified aircraft almost unattainable. Remember the Malibu that Jim worked on? It's been said the Venture is a Malibu that was hacked into three pieces and welded back together as a two-seater, which is not entirely far from the truth. There are many little reminders of the Malibu's heritage built into the Venture. The wings and tail, for example, are scaled-down versions of the Malibu's and use practically the same airfoil. Its long nose houses a Continental IO-550 with no turbocharging. Because of its short stance above the ground, it uses a short prop with very thick blades, allowing it to absorb all the horsepower and maximize thrust. Designed entirely using groundbreaking computer-based technology, also known as CAD-CAM, the Venture was built for maximum efficiency and little weight. At the time, the Quest Air was competing for market share with two other fast home builds, the Lancer and Glass Air. Unlike those designs which embrace fiberglass technology, Jim and his team stuck to what they knew best and built the Venture out of traditional aluminum instead. The Venture's rounded fuselage is intricately sculpted and flush riveted, revealing a perfectly smooth skin that rivals any aircraft with a composite fuselage. And this is where we begin to understand why the Venture looks the way it does. For starters, the landing gear on most high-performance aircraft are stowed away inside the wings which require a thicker wing area and therefore more drag. In order to minimize drag, Jim opted to keep the wings razor thin, so instead the Venture tucks the gears away inside the fuselage, not unlike a Cessna 210 or an F-16 for that matter. Need to slow the Venture down in a hurry? Not a problem, just slow down to 170 knots, drop the landing gear and watch it come down at 3000 feet per minute like an anvil. Because the Venture is very small to begin with, the wheels are proportionally tiny as well making ground operations a bit interesting, but more on that later. What about the Venture's egg shape? How can a plane that's so short even fly? Well, notice how both wings and tail are very long and narrow. This is called a high aspect ratio wing and works perfectly well for high performance missions. The distance between the wing and tail is in perfect harmony, which means it's just as stable as its competitors or any plane for that matter. Jim Griswold literally did away with as much fuselage as possible, leaving only as much room as necessary for the cockpit and tail surfaces. And thus, creating one of the lowest drag designs ever built. 
It should be noted that Adventure is only 16 feet from nose to tail, making it almost 8 feet shorter than a Cessna 150. So what makes people think the plane is so short is in fact the very wide fuselage coupled with the long wings. Which leads us to the next major Venture selling point. Remember when I mentioned that the Malibu was designed for maximum comfort at long ranges? Well, so was Adventure. The fuselage was an awe-striking 46 inches across, giving the pilot and passenger the same space as the Malibu. Part of this was because the landing gear was tucked away between the pilots, which conveniently added to the feeling of spaciousness to the Venture. So at this point you're thinking, okay, it's spacious and now the design is starting to make sense. But I bet it takes a pilot like Bob Hoover to fly the same, right? There's no way this plane is safe to fly. And once again, you'd be wrong. The Venture's slender control surfaces were perfectly synchronized with its side controllers, allowing it to fly smoothly at cruise speeds, while giving a good control harmony at low speeds and approach to landing. Hey, wait a minute, there's another famous plane with side sticks. The Cirrus SR-22. It turns out that Jim Griswold went to work for Cirrus years later and developed very similar side controls as used in the Venture. The breakout forces felt on the controls are handled by spring cartridges, which further added to the stability of the Venture. Okay, it's spacious, well balanced, and it flies well. But I bet it lands faster than an F-18, right? Wrong again. The Venture's wings are designed for both high and low speed. Employing wing cuffs at the outer edges of the wing, the Venture stalls at an easy and forgiving 60 knots. In fact, because of the spring cartridges used to handle control surfaces, it is very difficult to stall the Venture, and in most cases the plane will simply mush forward when the stick is pulled back. So now you're probably wondering, how fast is this tiny plane? I'm glad you asked. Let's keep in mind that the original Malibu had a 310 horsepower turbocharged engine. With less than half the size and half the weight, the Questair Venture was powered by a similar engine with 280 horsepower and no turbocharging. With this arrangement, most Ventures will easily cruise at 240 knots, all while sipping only 13 gallons of fuel per hour. To put this in perspective, your average Beechcraft Bonanza will burn about the same amount of fuel, but fly at 160 knots. I know it's an apples to oranges comparison, but still. At wide open throttle, the Venture will easily clock around 270 knots, well past 300 miles an hour. Needless to say, takeoffs are exhilarating, and the Venture launches off runways like a rocket. Cruise climbs are conducted at 150 knots with a climb rate of over 2,000 feet per minute. All this power and so little weight, several ventures have racked up many time to climb and world speed records for their category. In fact, one venture flew up to 35,000 feet, beating a record for altitude for a non-turbocharged plane. While not exactly considered an aerobatic aircraft, the Venture is rated for 6 positive Gs and 3 negative, allowing its pilots to have a little fun while cruising along. With a spacious cockpit, the Venture will carry its pilot between 800 and 1000 nautical miles, depending of course on how fast the pilots want to arrive at their destination. This is exactly what Jim Griswold intended for the tiny plane, and it fulfills this mission with ease. So did Jim fulfill his dreams of filling the sky in every airport with Ventures? Unfortunately, things didn't quite go as planned. If you recall, the Venture was sold as a complete kit, and even came included with an engine and prop, which was very rare for a kit. At the time, the kit sold for about $60,000, which was actually a good price considering it included a brand new Continental IO 550. Jim estimated your average pilot could screw together a Venture in about 2,000 hours. The package was irresistible, and over 100 kits were sold in the early 90s. What new Venture owners didn't realize was the insane amount of time and dedication required to piece the aircraft together. After spending thousands of hours, many Venture kits were sold off in frustration. For those few who made it to the finish line, they had invested around 5,000 hours and up to 10 years in building their aircraft. Many began to realize why it was named the Venture. Unfortunately, the long build time wasn't the only factor in the small Venture fleet size. Recall that tiny landing gear bolted to the bottom of the plane? It was a source of many headaches for new Venture pilots. The tiny nose wheel was commanded with a highly unique system which essentially allowed you to either turn the aircraft or use a brace, but not both at the same time. So this resulted in several runway excursion incidents, several which totaled the plane and also discouraged many from wanting to own or fly a Venture. Another quirk were the main landing gear oleo struts which had so much play that when rocked to one side 
the venture would keep leaning until the pilot turned the plane the other way. In an attempt to offer a more user-friendly version, the Quest Air Spirit was rolled out. This one was powered by Continental with 210 horsepower, but most notable of all were the fixed landing gear. The Spirit did not sell quite as good as Venture, which made it clear what pilots really wanted. Over the years, Venture owners have made modifications which improved handling and usability, but as a company, Venture never really bounced back, and eventually kits were no longer being produced. However, Questair LLC in Bolton, Mississippi carries parts and supports the current fleet of ventures. A real shame, as its small group of owners is very passionate about the venture. The venture can stall at only 60 knots while cruising at 240 knots, meaning it has an enviable 1 to 4 performance envelope. A few ventures wound up in the Reno, Nevada air races. A prime example belonged to Mike Dacey. Modified to produce around 700 horsepower, Mike won several races in its category. No doubt that competitors were dumbfounded by the little egg speeding past them at over 400 miles per hour. Between 20 to 30 ventures and spirits remain in airworthy condition. As a tight-knit group, venture owners across the country hang out together for the occasional fly-in. Considering how fast a plane goes and how far it can fly, not a tall order at all. Are you interested in owning a Venture? Kits are no longer available, however Ventures can be found from time to time on the used market. It does take some working knowledge of the aircraft to own and take care of, plus some finesse and piloting. But one thing is for sure, Venture ownership means you fly a plane that's unlike anything else in the sky. And that alone is worth the price of admission, even if it looks like an egg.